All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all today. My name is Scotty Kirkland. I have the privilege of being the exhibits, publications, and programs coordinator here at the archives. Just a couple of quick announcements before we uh, before we start the program. Uh, you know, there's only a few shopping days left before Christmas, and uh, the holiday season is is upon us. And I invite you, if you're here today, to visit the museum store. Uh, we are open right now, and so if you're here in the in the building with us, you can go down to the museum store. If you're watching online, uh, Alabama Originals. Dot com is the website. You can shop there, find a variety of products made by Alabama artists and history books aplenty. And for the person who has everything in your life, you can always give them the gift of history. You can give them a membership to the Friends of the Alabama Archives. That's a tax deductible membership that helps support the work of our agency in conservation care, educational outreach, and public programs. In fact, one of the collections that Haley's going to talk about today was purchased with Friends Fund. So it's a really great example of the fact that support for, to the Friends of the Archives really does help to preserve the stories of Alabama to tell to future generations. Friends membership cards look like this, and they're available at the uh, desk just outside of the lobby, uh, and they're also available in the museum store. While you're here today, we invite you to visit the second floor. If you haven't been to our new uh, temporary exhibit, it's called History Lives On, Preserving Alabama's Rosenwald Schools. Uh, that is up in our temporary gallery, which is to the uh, to the left to the right side as you get off the elevator uh, and that exhibit will be open through the end of august it's in partnership with the auburn university college of architecture design and construction uh, and it is really something we'll continue with our research rundowns which are our series of online history and genealogy how to's on monday january 8th at noon those are virtual programs only so you can catch them online streaming on youtube or facebook our speaker that day will be education curator, Dr. Hayden McDaniel. She'll be talking to us about the History Hub, which is an online clearinghouse for educational materials for Alabama's school children and teachers. That's something that the archives created and launched with its new website earlier this year. So you'll definitely want to uh, listen in for that. Again, that'll be a virtual only program on January the 8th, which is a Monday. Our 2024 slate of Food for Thought programs will resume on Thursday, January 18th, always the third Thursday, uh, with Dr. Dan T. Carter, a Professor Emeritus, University of South Carolina. Dr. Carter, of course, is no stranger to the archives. He conducted research here for his previous books on the trials of the Scottsboro Nine and on the life of George Wallace. He'll be discussing his new biography on Asa Forrest Carter. So that will be January the 18th. You won't want to miss that. Today's program brings to a close our 2023 Food for Thought series, and it seems an appropriate time to stop and to thank you, uh, our loyal attendees, those of you who are here with us in the auditorium, and those of you who are watching online for continuing to support this program, and a good time to pause and say thanks to our friends at the Alabama Humanities, Humanities Alliance, and also our support group, the Friends of the Alabama Archives, for their continued financial support of Food for Thought, which is the archive's longest running public program. Uh, going on almost 35 years of, of the third Thursday of the month. Uh, when you came in, you should have received a copy of our 2024 Food for Thought schedule. Uh, if you did not, you can pick one out on the way uh, on the way out, and those will also be mailed to you uh, very soon. And if you have not gotten the latest issue of Present and Past, the Archives newsletter, you can get one of those as well. Now, our very own Haley Aaron is today's speaker. She is the registrar here at the Department of Archives and History, where she manages donations of historical materials to the department's archival and museum collections. Haley's been in the archives for almost a decade now. She holds a bachelor's in journalism and history from Sanford University, a master's in history from Georgia State University, and an MLIS degree from the University of Alabama. She's a certified archivist, and a member of the American Association for State and Local History's 2023 History Leadership Institute cohort. Her research has been featured on C-SPAN and in Alabama Heritage Magazine and the essay collection entitled A Girl Can Do, Recognizing and Representing Girlhood. Join me to welcome our final Food for Thought speaker for the year, Haley Aaron. Thank you so much, Scotty, for that warm welcome. And thank you also to Zach Tonkins, who is one of our staff members that is managing our booth today and making sure that I look and sound as well as I can. 
and thank you all for being here and taking time out of your busy holiday schedule to be with us today. It's always a pleasure to share research, and that pleasure is enhanced when you see a room full of friendly faces. Historical research always begins with a series of questions, and I think the best questions are motivated by a, the need to understand ourselves and our communities more fully. We study the past to understand who we are and who we can become. So today I'd like to acknowledge the inspiration behind this presentation. My love of history and the questions I ask today in my work are largely inspired by my grandfather, Jackie Dean Hale. There are a lot of people who have supported me and blessed me along this journey, so there are a lot of stories I could tell about how I got here today, but the story I'd like to share today My grandfather was born in 1933 in Jones Chapel, Alabama. It was a rural community, and he grew up on a tenant farm. His family rented land, and they grew crops to survive. More than anything, my grandfather loved to share stories about his childhood and his young adulthood, stories that I loved to listen to and learn from. My grandfather was a child of the Great Depression, and he said that his family grew up poor, but that no one really realized that they were poor because everyone in their community was in the same boat. He remembered a time when Coca-Cola's cost a nickel, and he didn't have any idea what one tasted like because he didn't have a nickel to buy one. My grandfather would always tell fantastical stories that to a child were almost impossible to believe about his adventures in rural North Alabama. He talked about driving himself and his classmates to school in the school bus because his father, who was the substitute school bus driver, was too busy bringing in crops to be able to drive them to school. It was a very different time when he was in high school. He also loved to tell the story about how he met my grandmother, Willadine Wilhite, in typing class. There was one good typewriter to be shared in front of a classroom of students. My grandfather was happy to acquire it, but my grandmother demanded its use. I heard that there were tears and much pleading involved, but ultimately my grandfather passed his typewriter over to her, and little did my grandmother know, not only had she gotten the typewriter, he, she was also about to win her future husband as well. I decided based on the inspiration of my grandfather that I wanted to study um, and become a storyteller and to understand more about the little patch of earth that we shared. So when I went to college, I decided to study journalism and history. You can see here that I took a lot of notes from my grandfather along the way. And I was thrilled when I started this job 10 years ago and had the opportunity to take my grandfather on a tour of the Alabama Voices Gallery, which is located upstairs. I shared all of these wonderful stories that I was learning, all of these artifacts that I already felt attached to as we talked about the grand story of Alabama history. But I quickly noticed that my grandfather was uncharacteristically quiet throughout the tour. I could tell that he was proud of the work that I was doing and proud that I found a job that I loved, but he really wasn't sharing stories like he usually did. That all changed when we turned the corner and rounded the section called Mills, Mines, and Mules. Mills, Mines, and Mules talks about Alabama history from the late 19th and early 20th century. It acknowledges the industrial change that happens in Alabama during that time period and also tells us something about the fact that many Alabamians were still living on farms and in rural communities. So we turn the corner and he sees this life size mule in Mills, Mines, and Mules. And he stops in his tracks and immediately lights up. He's so excited to see this mule. And he stops and he tells me the story about Bert and Bess, the two mules that his family had owned, the mules that had helped till the land in North Alabama 75 years before. And after he told me that story, he got a little serious. And he said, Haley, as you were taking me through the museum, I thought you were only interested in the stories of important people. But as I look at this mule, I see that you're interested in my story too. 
What he said that day changed the way that I approached Alabama history. I realized that our history isn't just a moment of people making decisions and moving forward in the halls of power. Our history is also the story of people like my grandfather, people who loved well, who lived well, and who never made a large impact beyond the communities and the families that he loved. So I decided as a way to honor him to think about how I could focus on those stories of everyday Alabamians. I thought about the stories he had told me as a child about his own childhood, and I decided that I wanted to focus on telling the stories of children and young adults, finding those sources, and sharing them in the best way that I knew how. Today, I'd like to share the results of some of that research and talk a little bit about the wonderful collection of scrapbooks and diaries created by children and young adults here at the Department of Archives and History. I focus on sources created by teenagers, children, and young adults, people that are in their teens and their 20s. And I focus specifically on the scrapbooks and diaries that they wrote in their own words to tell their own stories. Rather than focusing on the childhoods of notable or well-known Alabamians, I decided to focus on collections that people really hadn't explored yet and look at the stories of everyday Alabamians and how history shaped their lives. <laughs> As I was preparing for this presentation, I found that most of these sources come to us from the 19-teens through the 1930s. That makes a lot of sense because that's still a time when scrapbooking and diary making are popular pastimes for both children and adults. It's also a time when scrapbooks and diaries become more commercially available and are marketed more directly to children. So it makes a sense that there are a lot more of those from that time period and that a lot more of them have been preserved. So I'd like to talk a minute about what makes these sources special. Diaries are wonderful resources because they provide us with a frequent written account of daily life. Um, sometimes lots of interesting things happen in diaries and sometimes we just have the mundane of the everyday. But they always tell us something about how people experienced the past. They're also interesting because typically people are more self-reflective in their diaries and typically people are going to write more openly and honestly because they're writing for an audience of one rather than an audience that's going to read a letter or someone in the future that this message is intended for. I'll mention here that we often use the term diary and journal interchangeably, but there is a pretty important difference. The Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus tells us that diaries describe the experiences, attitudes, and observations of the author. In contrast, journals merely record the events of the day with no additional commentary. We can see this difference in an example of two fantastic military collections that we have. This diary comes to us from Penrose Vast Stout, who was a Montgomery native who volunteered to serve as an aviator during World War I. As you can see from his sketches, and maybe if you can read his diary entry, he has a very clear and often humorous way to talk about what he's thinking and feeling. In this particular passage, even if you can't read it, you can probably we see our illustration of the devil dentist uh, operating on him. Um, he's describing here a particularly painful dental surgery. He said things went pretty well until all the anesthesia wore off and then it got painful very quickly. In contrast, the journal of J.R. Hughes doesn't really tell us a lot about what he's thinking or feeling. J.R. Hughes was a native of Gadsden and during the Civil War he fought with the 31st Alabama Regiment. His journal consists almost entirely of extremely brief descriptions of his experiences. Mostly he just gives us a date and a location where his camp is stationed. So we would love to know more about how he's feeling on the long march and what he's doing um, during combat, but he really doesn't give us that here in his journal. <laughs> Scrapbooks also provide a fantastic base of resources for us to study as well. Scrapbooking was a popular pastime in the 19th and 20th century, but the purpose of scrapbooking shifts over time. 
There's a wonderful collection of edited essays called The Scrapbook in American Life. And this source tells us that this transition was so dramatic that they actually talk about two different types of scrapbooks. They describe 19th century scrapbooks as primarily being manuscripts of learning and knowledge, places where you can maintain information for future reference. In the 20th century, scrapbooks served a very different purpose. The authors of the Scrapbook of American Life said that 20th century scrapbooks are spaces of self. They're places where people can document and reflect on their own personal experiences. And as I started looking at these 20th century spaces of self, I realized that there were a lot of themes that we could trace through the course of these scrapbooks. We can look at how scrapbooks are used as spaces of learning, spaces of belonging, and spaces of becoming. I also wanted to give you a look at what the difference in a 19th and a 20th century scrapbook looks like. 19th century scrapbooks are usually made from repurposed materials. You take a book that already has writing in it and you paste the information you want to save over it. These replaced commonplace books. So before newspapers and magazines are commercially available in a large way, if you had something you wanted to remember, you read it in a book, and then you hand wrote out whatever quote or passage you wanted to remember. Obviously, this was very labor intensive, so when newspapers and magazines became commercially available, it was a lot easier and a lot more fun to be able to clip out what you wanted to remember and paste it into a scrapbook. Most scrapbooks that we have from this time period are thematic. So if you're interested in gardening, you might look for information on varietals that grow well in the soil where you live. If you're interested in cooking, you're basically going to use this as a recipe book. I love this example from C.T. Raoul. This comes to us from a woman in Mount Meigs who was compiling the scrapbook in 1861. And if you look at the bottom of the page here, you can see that she's used her sheet music as a way to save and preserve these newspaper clippings. She's decided she doesn't want to play this anymore, and so she just glues directly over that sheet music. In contrast, 20th century scrapbooks serve a very different purpose. Part of this is because there are a lot more fun sources to include in scrapbooks. Photography is commercially available, so you can take snapshots of your friends and family and include them in postcard, uh, include them in your scrapbook. And in addition to things like newspaper magazines, you also have things like postcards that provide beautifully illustrated pictures of the places you've visited. So scrapbooks become a lot more colorful, and they also become more interested in preserving an, uh, an individual's personal or community memory. Scrapbooks from this time are purchased usually specifically for one purpose. They're not getting pasted over in sheet music uh, scrapbooks. So I've included an image here from one of the most popular types of scrapbooks that were marketed to children. This is called Schoolgirl Days, a memory book. And there are multiple titles of scrapbooks that are marketed to girls in the 19-teens and 1920s. Uh, these are intended for women who are graduating from high school or college, and they're very popular as graduation gifts. Girls compiled these with great care, and they cared about these so much that sometimes they even included them in their graduation photographs. We have this beautiful photograph from Pauline Catherine Jones, who is depicted here holding her copy of School Girl Day that she's compiled. She takes this picture and one picture with her diploma. So it tells you how much she values this particular scrapbook. The first theme that I'd like to talk about in detail today is the theme of learning. We see young Alabamians use scrapbooks and diaries as an educational activity, a way to improve their academic skills like writing and grammar, or to improve their social understanding, like their expectations of what their life as an adult might look like. 
So the first example I'd like to share today comes to us from the mid-19th century. This is the diary of John Rayburn. John Rayburn was a native of Gunnersville, and he was the only son of Samuel Rayburn and Sarah Davenport. And as you read his diary, it becomes readily apparent that his father, Samuel, takes an unusually hands-on interest in John's education. Samuel encourages John to write this diary, and in 1852, at the age of 14, John starts writing. His father had just hired a private tutor to instruct him in Latin and English grammar, and so Samuel thought this was a good chance for his son to practice his English grammar. John would sit down at the end of every day and write the business of the day for a 14-year-old. This included activities like going to the store to buy alcohol for his mother, studying Latin with that Latin tutor his father had just hired, and wandering happily in the woods whenever the tutor let him out of classes early. What's particularly interesting about this diary, though, is that John would write his business of the day, and then his father Samuel would sit down and read his journal entries. After he read those journal entries, he would provide advice. Samuel corrected his son's grammar and gave him lots of stern moral advice. He encouraged him to do things like not throw stones at birds, to treat adults with kindness and respect, and to be sure to take a bath before he sat down in his father's office chair to write the business of the day. <laughs> in my favorite entry from this diary, John described going to town to hear a political speech. At this time, politics was the business of men and political speeches were made in bars. So John goes to listen to this political speech and he's standing in the bar after the speech is over and one of the bar patrons takes objection to his young age and throws him out the window. John says that he's particularly upset about this. He cries a little bit and walks home to eat his dinner. But like all young men, John grew up quickly, and soon he too was old enough to participate in the political conversation for himself. All of the Latin lessons and the English grammar lessons paid off because he enrolled in Cumberland University in Tennessee. While he was a student there, tensions between the North and South continued to increase, and it was a hot topic of conversation among students. We have at least one of his speeches where he talks and argues against the dissolution of the Union. But in 1861, when war is declared, John sides with the Confederacy. He left college two months before his graduation to fight with the 9th Alabama Infantry Regiment. In just a few short months, he would see combat at Yorktown, Williamsburg, and Malvern Hill. He receives a particularly bad piece of news in August 1862. His mother had died while he was in college, and his father had remarried. In August of 1862, John learned that that new wife, his beloved stepmother, had been killed in the Union shelling of Gunnersville. In a letter home to his father, he described that shelling as a shocking deed which makes the heart bleed in sorrow and pant for revenge. John continues to fight, motivated by revenge, motivated by a will for his country, but he doesn't fight for very long. Only a month later, John himself was killed in action during the Battle of Antietam. All of the bright promise that his father had invested in him came to an end on a battlefield. Another aspect of learning is learning about social interactions and what we can expect from social norms. We've got two fantastic collections of paper dolls that give us some suggestions of what that might look like for young women who are in Alabama. Juliet Hampton Morgan was a Montgomery native who was born in 1914, and her scrapbook, in addition to a lot of other sources about her life and her childhood, includes these beautiful hand-illustrated dolls. We have two different dolls in this collection who have about 30 different dresses between the two of them. 
we can date these based on the fashion of the clothing that the dolls are wearing. And based on that, we date these to the late 19 teens and the early 1920s. What that means is that Juliet probably would have started playing with these at around the age of six and might have continued playing with them up through the age of around 15. What I'd love for you to know and what is most interesting about these paper dolls is that in real life, these are extremely small. We're looking at dolls that are about two to three inches tall at most, and these are exquisitely illustrated. Uh, you can see here that our paper doll has um, little pointed feet so she can fit into her heels when she tries on different dresses. When you look on the far right and see this beautiful black dress, with this uh, red shawl that she's wearing over it. All of this is hand-drawn and penciled in. So these are beautifully detailed. I honestly think that they might not have been created by Juliet because this would have been a lot of artistic skill and motor skill to be able to accomplish something like this when you were six years old. What that suggests, because these are so small and so beautifully illustrated, they might not have been made by Juliet. Instead, they might have been a gift illustrated by an older relative, probably her mother or her grandmother who she lived with. And it, talk, it speaks to the fact that paper dolls were a form of intergenerational play. It's something that older sisters or mothers could share with their daughters. What is also interesting about this particular collection of paper dolls is because when we look at paper dolls, we see examples of the careers and the aspirations that were open to women at the time. And what's notable about Juliet's collection of paper dolls is that out of 30 dresses and outfits that her doll owns, only two really depict women at work. So I've included one of those examples here. You see this nursing outfit that her doll is wearing. This became really popular as a topic for paper dolls after World War I because nurses had served with great acclaim on the front lines during World War I as life and providing life-saving service. And and they became a romanticized vision of the nurse as a career that was open to women uh, that becomes uh, apparent through paper dolls as well. The other outfit that possibly depicts work is a picture of a girl dressed as a housekeeper. She's got a pink possibly uniform on and she's got a little frilly apron on, which indicates that she's probably cleaning the house. But of all of those paper dolls, all of those fashions that are included, there are only two careers that are presented as opportunities for Juliet through her creative play with her paper dolls. The second collection of paper dolls I'd like to talk about is the collection of Lena Margaret Jones. Lena was a Birmingham native who was born in 1904. You can probably see from this that in a lot of ways, her paper dolls are much less elaborate than Juliet's. That's because they are cut out of newspaper and magazine advertisements. These don't have interchangeable clothing, but they're individuals that Lena um, includes in her own personal narratives of what womanhood could look like as she grew into an adult. There are hundreds of these that are meticulously cut out and stored between the pages of the Ladies' Home Journal dated October 1915. Uh, based on the clothing of these dolls, we date these from the mid-19-teens to the mid-1920s. What that suggests is that Lena started collecting paper dolls around the age of 11 and continued collecting them until her early 20s. What I love about Lena's collection is that when you open up the Ladies Home Journal, you see that she's compiled these dolls into family groupings that have their own names and their own personalities. There's the mother and the father and the children at play. She's learning about family structures and about the expectations that her society has for her as a future mother and a future wife. Her dolls also have paper accessories, things like dishes and rugs and furniture that she's cut out of these newspaper advertisements, and she's placed on little paper stands so she can prop them up while she's playing or she can slot them into a paper dollhouse. 
this all gives her a sense of what life might look like as she grows into adulthood. The other interesting thing that I'd like to mention about Lena's paper dolls is that her topic changes as she gets older. So most of the 19 teens dolls have come from a variety of perspectives. A lot of them are middle class men, women, and children. But by the time we reach the 1920s, the dolls are almost exclusively brides. They're dressed in extremely fashionable clothing, and they really represent the height of style in the mid-1920s. What this suggests to me is that Lena started collecting paper dolls as a young woman, and she continued to collect them as she was thinking about her marriage. She marries in Jack Rawls in 1926, and by the time she marries, this paper doll collection has helped her think about the kind of mother and wife she wants to be and helped her pick out her wedding dress. I'll also mention that this has a generational aspect as well. Lena's mother is Leah Raw, uh, Lena's daughter is Leah Rawls Atkins, who inherited this collection of paper dolls from her mother and was told to cherish it and play with it carefully. Uh, Dr. Atkins is a name you're probably familiar with. She actually is one of our best known and and, uh, most accomplished Alabama historians in her own right. So I like to think the paper dolls might have played a role in that. The second topic I'd like to talk about today is this, this topic of belonging. Scrapbooks and diaries provided space for children and young adults to think about how they interacted with their neighbors and their friends. These spaces of self-reflection encouraged their compilers to think about what they contributed as individuals to their schools and their communities. They also fostered a sense of belonging within those communities. The first scrapbook I'd like to talk about in this category is the 1930 scrapbook of Blanche Batchelor. Blanche Batchelor was a native of Elmore County, and she later moved to a farm in Escambia County. She joined her 4-H club in 1934 at the age of 10, and it was an important part of her life throughout her high school career. Blanche felt deeply the need for an organization like 4-H that encouraged students to excel in academic and agricultural life, and she took to heart the pledge of 4-H, which is, I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Blanche Batchelor loves 4-H and is so actively involved that she serves as president of the Alabama 4-H Council in the year 1939 to 1940, and she's asked to attend the National 4-H Encampment in Washington, D.C., where she had the opportunity to meet President Franklin Roosevelt. What I love about Blanche's scrapbook is that she gives us an unparalleled look at what life looks like for a young girl growing up on a farm during the Great Depression. One of the things she did as a 4-H club project was to keep records and complete record books about the activities of the club. Some of these record books talk about how to take care and organize your room. So we've got an outline of every piece of furniture and every illustration that she hangs on the wall in her childhood bedroom. And another one talks about maintaining your clothing in a way that doesn't involve spending a lot of money on new clothes. So we have record books that list every single piece of clothing that she owned during the Great Depression. This example comes from her at the age of 11. And according to the inventory she compiles. So she owns 66 pieces of clothing. That sounds like a lot of clothing for the time, and it is a lot of clothing for the time, but it's important to note that this, this compilation includes things like socks, shoes, underwear, and handkerchiefs. So I try to do a count of my own closet, and I am certain that I can't count the number of socks that I have. Um, Blanche had a total of 22 dresses and three pairs of shoes, so that gives you a sense of what her clothing list looks like. She also provides us with a list of things that she does to serve her community and her family outside of regular 4-H club work. 
In one of these prompts, she lists 37 activities that she completes for her family and her community on a daily basis. This includes relatively easy run-of-the-mill assignments like getting ice for tea, washing and drying dishes, but it also includes things that are specific to life on a farm. Things like picking peaches and milking cows. It also talks to a level of increasing responsibility because she talks about taking care of younger children when her parents were unavailable. I'd like to turn now to another uh, grouping of scrapbooks that talk in great detail about the sense of becoming or uh, belonging in the sense of community. We talked a little bit earlier about girl graduate journals, and this is an example of one of those girl graduate journals. This comes to us from Mignon Singleton, who was a sophomore at the Alabama Technical Institute and College for Women, an institution that we know today as the University of Montevallo. She was completing her two-year program in 1922, and like most girls who have a girl graduate journal, she completes um, a listing of her own personal activities, focusing on how she is directly involved with her class and with her campus. You can see some really fantastic snapshots here. We've got her um, riding in the wagon on the way to a community activity that is hosted in the rural community, relatively rural community of Montevallo. And you can also see her at the front gate uh, standing out there with her friends. Girl graduate journals are wonderful because they are filled with all sorts of fun in-jokes, some of which we can interpret today and some of which remain a mystery only to those who compiled them themselves. Uh, what I love about Mignon's scrapbook is she includes in this miscellaneous page a list of things we craved while we were away from college. This list includes some things that you would probably expect a young woman from any time period to want when they were far away from home. She wanted dates, candy, men, and time away from class. A few others seem a little cryptic to the modern eye. She includes things like toilet requisites, which are things like uh, perfume. She also talks about wanting a flipper, which is slang for a very fast and very expensive car. What I love about Mignon is that this page is showing us that she's closely reading magazines and newspapers and using what she's finding there to define her own personal experiences. She even includes an advertising slogan here. Down at the bottom, she says that she wants a skin you love to touch. This was a popular advertising slogan for a brand of soap called Woodbury's Facial Slo Soap. And it's interesting to think that a girl in Montevallo was so invested in this product that she included it on her list of desires from college. We have another set of scrapbooks that also documents the college experience, but the approach that it takes to documenting campus life is very different than the experiences of Mignon's and the approach that other girl graduate journalers take. Rather than focusing on her own personal experiences, Minnie Lee Lyons looked at the role that Tuskegee Institute played in the life of the broader African-American community. We're a little unsure on when these are compiled. We have two examples of these, but the earliest features photographs taken from the 1920s when Minnie Lee was in her early 20s. What's interesting about her scrapbooks is there are almost no references to her own personal experiences. She includes only two or three photographs where she herself is identified, which is very stark contrast to someone like Mignon Singleton. But in contrast, she provides a detailed biographical information about her brother and her father who had moved to Newark, New Jersey in the late 1920s. Her scrapbook includes the kind of candid images that you would expect from a graduation journal or a journal that focused on college. But instead of personal reflections and identifications in the margin, she includes these long quotes from Booker T. Washington and other leaders at Tuskegee that focused on themes of racial uplift, the value of labor, and the importance of education and physical fitness. 
Minnie Lee is also really interested in documenting the daily lives of people who live and work on the campus at Tuskegee. This is really unusual for scrapbooks about college from this time. On this page, in a scrapbook where she documents the identity of almost no one, she lists the chef, the name of the chef at Tuskegee. She identifies him as Lark Cumming, and she even mentions that his specialties on campus were baked turkeys and candied yams. You can see that he's holding a turkey there getting ready to cook. Another thing that I think it's important to note about the scrapbooks of Minnie Lee Lyons is that despite all of my best efforts to track evidence down, there's no existing evidence that Minnie Lee Lyons ever attended Tuskegee. We know that her brother graduated from the college in the 1920s, and there are a lot of newspaper articles that talk about her visits to him on campus. She goes to some of the social clubs and events, but there's no evidence that she ever attended Tuskegee, and she's not listed on the role of Tuskegee Institute graduates. So why would she take all of this effort, this painstaking effort, to document a college that she never attended? I think when we look closely at the scrapbook, there are two things that suggest themselves. First, I think it's a way to honor her brother and her father. During the Great Migration, um, her brother and her father moved to take work in Newark, New Jersey, and Minnie Lee married in 1927, so she was left alone in Montgomery while her family moved away. They were separated by distance, but not in heart, and I think that was a way to acknowledge this. I also think this focus on labor and this focus on achievement also honored labor that she undertook as an adult. We know based on census records that she worked for more than three decades in housekeeping, a job that was one of the few that were open to African American women, a job that can sometimes be insulting and often difficult, hard work that was largely unrecognized. I think as she's talking about themes of labor and racial uplift, she's honoring her own labor as a housekeeper that largely goes unrecognized. She's acknowledging that all labor has dignity, and I think that's an important message for her to carry forward. The final theme that I want to talk about today are spaces of becoming. These scrapbooks and diaries served as spaces for their compilers to think deeply about who they were and who they wanted to become. Through their written reflections, we can see how historical events impacted the lives of everyday young Alabamians. The first set of journals I'd like to talk about today are the journals of Russell Franklin Hicks. Russell Franklin Hicks was a Florida native who moved to Alabama in January in 1922, driving his car named Lizzie to Mulga, Alabama, where he took his job as a poultry farmer. He was a veteran, and we get a sense that he has a bit of a question about what his identity looks like after completing military service. He served with the 6th Engineer Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division during World War I, and he was wounded during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. You can see here he describes himself as a native of Florida and an ex-soldier in his illustration of himself. His first impression of Mulga was less than favorable. On January 5th, 1922, he wrote, Mulga looks like the last rose of summer with the petals all plucked. The girls seem to have plenty of nerve, but not much common sense. Moonshine, plentiful. His morale did not greatly improve throughout the year of 1922. He found labor at the poultry farm demanding. He didn't like the early hours and the low pay. And he soon found out that his boarding house was leaky and the food that he could have to eat was terrible. He said that the coffee he drank was so weak that it came in on crutches. <laughs> and he ate so many half-cooked lima beans that by February 1st, 1922, he observed the state flower of Alabama, state fruit, and most beloved is the lima bean. <laughs> 
Russell was also looking for a wife as he came to Molga. He had a girlfriend at home, but she was writing less and less, so he decided to go to church and see if he could find someone that matched his fancy. But the ladies of Molga were difficult to impress. On July 6th, he asked a lady from his church on a date, but she refused him. He wrote, I guess me being a working man don't entitle me to any company, company with these classy mogul lassies. But in August 1922, his luck starts to shift a little bit. He meets a girl named Ruth Henderson at a church bake sale who catches his eye. He mentions there that she sold a lot of baked goods, um, and I'm sure that her attractive uh, demeanor uh, had nothing to do with it. He doesn't talk a lot about her in 1922, but by 1923, on January 1st, she's the first person that he mentions in his diary. And just a few days later, he's editing unsavory language out of his earlier diary entries so she can read it. <laughs> he complains about a lack of funds in the winter and spring of 1923. And we realize that that's the case because by the end of March, he had ordered an engagement ring an 18 karat gold ring with six diamonds and a blue sapphire. On Easter Sunday, he presented that ring to Ruth and she happily accepted. And on September 1st, 1923, Ruth and Russell were married after he did his morning shift at the poultry farm. <laughs> It's wonderful to read Russell's diaries because he writes almost daily for decades. And we can watch as Ruth and Russell settle into married life and remain in Alabama. Even as life became busier and busier, Russell kept up his daily diary writing practice. But in the 1930s, there's a drastic shift in the tone and the tenor of his diaries. In 1930, he stopped writing every day and he just provided monthly summaries of what was happening. Those monthly summaries became increasingly desperate. In a series of bad events that he um, attributed to depression, bad checks, and bad luck, he lost his job in July 1930, and a set of loans and business deals with his friends all fell through, and he was left with almost nothing to feed his wife and his growing family of children. In October 1930, his third son, James Edward, was born, but there was little rejoicing. Russell wrote, October found me jobless and downhearted, homeless and sometimes hungry. We now have three boys, no job, broke. It took a long time for Russell Franklin Hicks to find his feet again, but his family survived the Great Depression and he found himself back on his feet working those hard jobs for a family that he loved. He remained in Alabama for most of the next decade and then ultimately moved back to Florida where he was from. The Great Depression also impacted the life of Lavinia Bright Walker, although she felt the impact a lot less than Russell Franklin Hicks. Walker was the niece of Thomas Abraham McLeod, who was the son of formerly enslaved African Americans, who was able to purchase land in Shelby County and establish a large and successful farm. During the Great Migration, most of his children and other relatives moved north to find greater job opportunities and to escape race, racial discrimi discrimination. Lavinia's family was one of those communities that moved. She moved to Detroit at the age of four and stayed there for the rest of her life. Lavinia started this diary on January 1st, 1930, at the age of 13, and wrote almost daily through 1934. So it tracks us through the middle of her high school years, through the middle of her college years. Like most 13-year-old girls, she's interested in a couple of key topics. She's interested in school, friends, and romance. She's very interested in romance, but you get the sense that she's unsure of how to approach it. On January 23rd, 1930, she mentions that her friend had been to a kissing party. And she said, I asked mother if it was all right to kiss a boy at a party. And she said she thought so. So if I go to another party with boys and they play kissing games, I'll play too. For the next three days, she writes about how much she wants a boyfriend and how much she's interested in romance. 
She continues to be a little inexperienced in the ways of love. September 14th, 1932, she writes, Gee, diary, I'm excited. Mother says that I may walk home with boys sometimes, and they can come over sometimes. The trouble is, I don't know anyone to ask. <laughs> Lavinia's life is also impacted by uh, other topics that affect the lives of Alabamians um, during this time period. She gives us an interesting perspective on race that's very different than a girl her age would have experienced in Alabama. In Detroit, Lavinia gives speeches at several white churches. She participated in club meetings with white students, and she attended at least some integrated classes. However, she still noticed the pain of racial disparity. On January 22nd, 1930, she went to go swimming, but the pool didn't allow colored girls to swim. She said, now if I want to go swimming, I will have to go over onto Brewster. That's a mean jip. Uh, she also talks about a visit to uh, Flint, Michigan with her parents, where she notices the disparity between white housing and black housing and talks about how much she preferred Detroit. The Great Depression impacted her most highly in 1933 when her school closed early to cut costs. Her family was unable to pay for the burial of her uncle, and she had very little money to buy Christmas presents for her parents. By the end of 1933, she was sick of it, and she said she hoped that the Depression would be over soon. Lavinia's diary also gives us a strong connection of Alabama to Alabama that continues even in Detroit. When she ultimately finds the man she's going to marry, he's a native of Birmingham, Alabama. And we hear from her diary that she frequently attends meetings at the Talladega Club, which was a club that was created to provide encouragement and connection from Alabamians who had moved to Detroit. The last set of scrapbooks I want to talk about today are a set of scandal scrapbooks that were created by Helen Angel and Pat Pardue. Unlike Lavinia, they are not afraid to actively pursue romance. They create their scrapbooks in their late teens and early 20s. They're friends that live in Florence in 1930, and they share a lot of the same interest. They both work for the Gardner Warring Knitting Mill. They both love movies, and they are both boy crazy. On their off days, they like to sit in the park, read movie magazines, and describe their own turbulent love lives with pictures clipped from movie and romance magazines. Their scrapbook described visits to the Bloody Bucket, which was a roadhouse in North Alabama. They described dances with boys and dates with men who had just come into town to work for the Civilian Conservation Corps. The Archives owns one scrapbook that was compiled by Pat Pardue, and although she dates a couple of men, she really only has eyes for one. Her consistent beau is named Roy Broadway, and she says here that she hopes she will always be this happy with Roy, that she lives for love. Uh, through a few minor fits and starts, that is who she ends up with. She married Roy Broadway in 1937. Helen's road to love was a little more rocky. She compiled three scrapbooks that we have, which describe frequent dates with at least five different suitors named Bill, Wiley, Lloyd, Herschel, and Jack, among others. Helen identified herself in her scrapbooks as Tiny Angel, and she presents herself as a world-weary lover who is unlucky in love. You can see here that Tiny Angel is dangerous to the hearts of men. Helen also loved to keep anything that anyone ever gave her. She keeps every gift that a boyfriend ever hands to her. So that means her scrapbook is filled with things like gum and candy wrappers, handkerchiefs, a box of matches, and a firecracker. So you can see how interesting it is to preserve something like this. Ultimately, Helen marries none of the men in this scrapbook. In 1945, she marries Kenneth Casperson after she strikes up a wartime correspondence. However, the road to love remained rocky, and in the 1960s, she divorced Kenneth and married Bill Maloney, who is one of our suitors in the scrapbook. 
By exploring these sources, I hope that you agree the scrapbooks of young Alabamians are really an engaging but underutilized resource. They provide us with unique insights to how young Alabamians looked at a variety of sources to define their own lived experiences and talk about their place in the world. I also hope that this presentation encourages you to think about how you share your own stories, how you enhance the study of Alabama history by sharing stories like my grandfather shared with me. And now we're ready for qu questions. And as uh, Scotty comes around, I wanted to issue a big thank you to our collections donors because most of our collections come to us from private donations. And with the exception of the Russell Franklin Hicks diaries, all of these materials were donated to us. And all of, most of these were donated within the last 10 years. So the story continues. I also want to issue a big thank you to the ADAH staff members that make Food for Thought possible. I couldn't list names. This got too long and too small. But there's a lot of labor behind Food for Thought that makes this such a wonderful experience as a speaker. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and I appreciate your questions. We do have time for some questions. Let's start right here. Thank you so much for that wonderful exposition of how it used to be. Do letters, particularly my family's as an example, play any part of this study? So I focused intentionally in this presentation on scrapbooks and diaries. A lot of times because children and young adults, when they're writing letters, they're coerced to write letters by your parents. So a lot of things are thank you notes that are written to family members or things that don't express their true feelings. So letters are a tremendous resource, but they're not something I looked at most directly here. Other questions? Well, Haley, I have one okay. um, for our guests who are who have scrapbooks, perhaps of their own or of their their family members, but they're not quite ready to donate them. Tell us about some good uh, conservation care for those pieces to make sure that they last for generations. Sure. So scrapbooks are particularly complicated to preserve because there are so many different types of material that can be glued into a scrapbook. Um, generally speaking, you want to put things in a good climate-controlled environment away from direct sunlight. If you want to invest in some preservation materials for scrapbooks, an acid and lignin-free box is always a good thing to store those scrapbooks in. And if you've got pages where you've got newspaper clippings or something highly acidic that are facing photographs and you're seeing stains happen, you can also buy acid-free tissue paper to slot in between those uh, pages. Perfect. Any other questions? Well, what was the name of your they were Bert. So my grandfather's mules were named Bert and Bess. And he said that Bert was the nice one and Bess was the mean one. <laughs> All right. Well, another round of applause for Haley Aaron. Thank you all so much for joining us today and for the entire year of 2023 Food for Thought programming. We look forward to seeing you in the new year, January 18th, as we kick off the new series with Dr. Dan Carter and take this moment to wish you all a very happy holiday season and a happy new year. Thank you all. Be well. Thank you.